Uh, good morning, church. My name is Mitchell Kang. I'm going to be reading 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 to 14. And um, just to let you all know, this is my first time, so I'm pretty nervous about it. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel, 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah and Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outposts at Jeba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. The news, sorry. Saul had attacked the Philistine outposts, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings, and Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines might come down against me at Gilgal. I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Oh, yeah, that, um, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mitchell. One of our values here at River Life is to entrust the space for the next generation, that we entrust them with the responsibilities to not only be a part of service, but to also lead us in service. And so this morning, we had the opportunity to entrust Harper leading us with the opening prayer. We had uh, just now a moment to entrust Mitchell in reading scripture for us. And so again, one of our values here at River Life that we're leading to is not only that we are a church for the next generation, but we are a church that is entrusting this space for the next generation. And so kids, youth, we welcome you and we entrust this space with you as well as the adults. And so again, we do not apologize for the noises, for the for the presence, for the smells and the sounds that the kids make. We welcome all of them because we entrust them to be a part of River Life, uh, to, to experience God's hope, healing, growth for them as well as us. And so thank you for all of our kids who are here with us and all who have helped us out with service. Um, a thank you to all of our volunteers this morning who woke up early to help set up our, our back to school bash. And so can we give a hand to all of our volunteers who were here this morning to help us out? Again, could not do this without you. And so thank you so much for sacrificing sleep, for being out in the warm weather, setting things up. Again, we're going to get to back to school bash here really shortly. But before we do, let me walk us through the sermon. And so today, we continue our At The Movie series, and we're going to talk about the number one hit this year, Inside Out Part 2. Inside Out Part 2 has respectively found itself on the top 10 Lifetime grossing film. So in its short time, Inside Out 2 has found itself on the top 10 lifetime grossing film, uh, competing with blockbuster hits like Avatar, Avengers Endgame, and Infinity War, and The Lion King. And so far this year, it's been my favorite movie, and I enjoy it because it's a really fun way of talking about our emotions and what happens specifically when we transition from being kids to teenagers. And so let's watch a quick trailer to see what's all about in case you haven't had a chance to see Inside Out 2. All right, so in the first part of Inside Out, the five primary emotions that were highlighted 
uh, were these five. And so I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna. I'm gonna need your help to remind me all of the characters. And so the one in the yellow. What's her name? Joy. Joy. How about the red one? Anger. Anger. How about the blue one? Sadness. Sadness. And the green one? Yeah. Disgust. And lastly, the fifth one. The one purple one. Fear. Fear. So those five were the highlighted emotions. Inside Out 2, like the trailer, introduces four new emotions. Can you help me with these four? The orange one is anxiety. The blue one is envy. The pink one is embarrassment. And lastly, the purple one is ennui. I don't know what ennui even means, but it's a cool word. And so these four emotions are the new ones. And anxiety, this one, is the highlight of Inside Out 2. And anxiety is the contrast of joy. This morning, we're going to take some time to talk about anxiety. So what is anxiety exactly? Anxiety is the feeling of being worried, being nervous, being worried about something that could happen in the future or being something that you expect to happen in the future. And we all experience anxiety to one degree or another. Let me share with you how I've experienced anxiety in the past. So as a kid, I experienced anxiety walking home from the bus stop after one day a dog chased me home. And so after that day, whenever my bus stop came, as a kid, I started feeling tense. I started feeling nervous. I started feeling scared. And when I passed by the house, I would always look to see if there was any evidences of the dogs that chased me, if they were there or, or if they weren't. And sometimes I would get so nervous that I would start crying. I constantly looked to make sure there was no dogs around me. It was the least favorite part of my day. And sometimes the anxiety would show up in ways where my stomach would get tight. I would feel tension in my body. As an adult, I still felt anxiety. As an adult, I remember taking on an internship and after the first few weeks, one day my boss got really upset at me about a mistake I had made and started saying things that felt very mean about me. It made me feel so bad that I couldn't go into the office next day. So I called in saying that I was sick, but I was so worried that I was going to make another mistake and she was going to chew me out again. Throughout the weekend, it was even hard to drive near the office because I felt nervous just thinking about seeing my boss again. I could feel the tension. I could feel my stomach twist into knots. And so anxiety is an emotion that we all experience to one degree or to another. Now, a little bit of anxiety is, can be healthy because it helps us motivate and prepare for the thing that we're worried about. If it's a test, if it's a project, if it's an interview, a little bit of anxiety can help motivate us to prepare for it. But a lot of anxiety can be really unhealthy because it can cause us to do or not do things that we should be doing. And so in the movie Inside Out 2, anxiety is the emotion that wrecks havoc in Riley's life. Riley's a young girl who's the main character uh, and the emotions that are going through her head. We find out anxiety causes Riley to do a lot of things that isn't normal for her. Riley gets so worried, so nervous, so anxious about what will happen or what could happen. And so it causes her to make decisions that negatively impact her and negatively impact those that she cares for. And similarly, the Bible is filled with anxious people as well too. One particular person in the Bible who let anxiety control him was Saul. And it comes from the passage that Mitchell read to us earlier. We heard again a little bit about what happened, and we're going to go a little in depth to understand anxiety, understand what the Bible says about it, and what we can do with our anxiety. And so Saul was the first king of Israel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people of Israel asked Samuel, who was a prophet, they asked Samuel to give them a king. At this point, God was their king, but Samuel, they had, uh, the people asked Samuel for prophet. Samuel represented God, and he got upset because, again, God was their king, but God had told Samuel, hey, they have rejected me. They want to be like other nations. They want a human king to lead them into battle. And so give them their human king. And so God allowed Samuel to appoint Israel their very first king, and it was Saul. 
Saul was someone who was tall. He was very handsome. He looked the part. But unfortunately, Saul was driven by his anxiety. And that resulted in him in making some bad decisions. Again, he looked like a king, but he didn't act like one because of his anxiety. In 1 Samuel 13, Saul and the Israelites were going to go into battle against the Philistines, but they needed, they had to wait for Samuel to come to make an offering. Sometimes before battles, an offering was made. This is first mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Right after Saul is anointed as king, Samuel tells Saul, wait for me to come and I'll make an offering, okay? This is, this is a commandment. You got to wait for me to come and I'll make an offering before we go to battle. Now, the purpose of these offerings was to demonstrate a person's trust, a person's obedience, and a person's dedication to God. And offerings were only carried out by priests. So only the priests could carry out an offering. They were the only ones who were supposed to carry out an offering. But in 1 Samuel 13, we're told that Saul's army is quaking with fear. They're really scared. They're really nervous. And some of them start to leave. And this caused Saul's anxiety to shoot out of the roof. And, and so he's like, I got to do something about this because my people are starting to leave me. My soldiers are starting to leave me. And so he chooses not to obey Samuel's commandment. He chooses not to obey a direct commandment from God. He doesn't wait for Samuel, takes all the things needed for the offering and makes the offering for himself. When Samuel finally arrives, this is how Samuel responds to Saul's actions. What have you done? You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Now sure, priests were the only people who carried out offerings, but the real issue at hand was Saul's heart. Heart, out of impatience, out of fear, out of self reliance, self dependence on his own ability, Saul's anxiety causes him to disobey God, to disobey Samuel, to disobey the commandment that's, that has been given to him. And so he takes it upon himself to control the situation, to prove to his soldiers that he is in control instead of trusting God through the prophet Samuel. Now we get an even clearer picture of Saul's anxiety in 1 Samuel 15. Before Saul goes into another battle with the Amalekites, Samuel gives Saul a message from God to spare none of the Amalekites and their belongings. And after Saul defeats the Amalekites, he takes the king captive and plunders the best livestock. He doesn't obey what God commands him to do. Samuel confronts Saul the next day asking why he disobeyed God again and Saul offers a reason in 1 Samuel 15, verse 24. This is what Saul says to Samuel. I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now, while some argue that Saul isn't taking ownership of his disobedience and his anxiety, and he's finding an excuse to shift the blame to others, I think it's worth considering that in 1 Samuel 13, he carried out the sacrifice because the soldiers were leaving him. Saul had this issue of he was always worried about what people were thinking of him. And so Saul's anxiety stemmed from what others thought of him, which caused him to do unreasonable things, to cause him to do things to save himself rather than to obey what God wanted him to do and to focus on God's desires and not his desires nor other people's desires. God wanted Saul to feel certain about his identity in God and not others. But unfortunately, Saul's disobedience results in God rejecting Saul as king and choosing David to become Israel's new king. But before David becomes king, Saul's anxiety continues to steer and control him to do so many unreasonable things. If you can imagine inside out too, how there's a control panel, how the emotions control it, Saul's control panel was bright orange with anxiety. Anxiety was ruling his entire life. After David defeats Goliath, he jo David joins Saul's army, becomes a successful military, military leader, completing many missions that Saul sent him on. 
When they returned home from their missions, the people would praise David over Saul for David's success. And this made Saul jealous. And then Saul was concerned that he was no longer the center of attention. So to steal back the spotlight, Saul tries to kill David many times. If you read all of 1 Samuel after chapter 18, there's many times where Saul tries to kill David. Over and over again, Saul tries to kill David. Saul is driven by his anxiety, by his pride, by his own desire. And unfortunately, that comes to his own demise he dies, the kingdom and his reign collapses. Now to avoid Saul's ending, we have to consider what we need to do with our own anxiety. I wish we could tell you that we can simply avoid it, but like I mentioned earlier, we all experience it to one degree or another. And we have to be mindful of how anxiety is controlling us. So what do we do when anxiety does, when we do experience anxiety? While Saul is the perfect example of what we shouldn't do, David is the perfect example of what we should do. And so David is referred to as a man after God's own heart. Throughout the Bible, that's how the Bible refers to David. But by no means was David perfect. David wasn't perfect in any way. David had an affair with Bathsheba and then plotted to get Bathsheba's husband killed. And so he, he failed in his own ways. David failed in his own ways. But what made David different from Saul was this. David's desire was for God. David's desire was for God. David was aware that God was in control of his life. So he studied and he meditated in God's word throughout his life. We see some of it in the Psalms that he wrote, like Psalms 119, verses 47 to 48. David also lived a life full of gratitude. He was also always thankful to God. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, this is what it says about being anxious and being thankful. I'm going to read it for us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Philippians remind us that with our anxiety in every situation, prayer, petition, that when we go to God, God trades our anxiety for his peace. And that's what David did. David demonstrated his gratitude to God. And in the Psalms, specifically in Psalms chapter 100, verse 4, this is what David says. Enter his gates, enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And so David lived a life of gratitude, of thankfulness. David, unlike Saul, was also very sorry of the mistakes that he made. He admitted to his faults, unlike Saul, who shifted the blame to others. Earlier, I mentioned how David had an affair. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, David admits to Nathan, another prophet, admits to Nathan his sin. And Psalm chapter 51 is a prayer of repentance to God. He repents to God for what he did, for the affair that he had, and he asked for God's forgiveness. Now, I'm only going to read a couple of the first verses, but the entire, entire chapter 51 of Psalms 51 is worth reading. And so, again, I'm going to encourage you to read, that, um, read it for yourself. But notice how sorrowful he is of his mistake. Let me read it for us. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What we can learn from David's anxiety is this. It's okay to let go of things out of our control and give it to someone who can help us. It's okay to let go of the things we can't control and give it to someone else who can help us. When we begin to, take, when we begin to get anxious, take deep breaths. Question your thought patterns. How realistic are the things that I'm worried about? Challenge the things that cause you to feel worried and nervous and then determine what's actually true and what you imagine to be true. Take control of what you can and let go of the things that you can't. Let go of what you can't control and give it to God. 
1 Peter chapter 5, 7 reminds us this. Cast all your anxiety on Him, on God, because He cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Give all your anxieties, the ones you can and the ones you cannot control to God, because He cares for you. When we give up things that make us anxious, like I mentioned earlier, God gives us His peace. And so this morning as I wrap up, I want us to take just a minute to give to God whatever it is that makes you anxious. It could be something right now. It could be something that, has, that you felt anxious throughout all your life. But I want you to take, take, take a minute here to take into consideration to give to God what makes you anxious. For some of us, it might be the new school year. Maybe for some of us, we're going into a new school and we don't have any friends. Maybe our finances are tight and that's making us anxious. Maybe we have relational issues with close people in our life. Maybe it's our boss. Maybe it's our parents. Maybe it's our family. Maybe it's our kids. Maybe it's our spouse. Maybe we're uncertain of how we're going to care for our loved ones. Maybe it's our health and our well-being. Think of something that causes you to feel anxious. So I'm going to give you a couple seconds. And whatever comes to mind, don't think too hard. Whatever comes to mind, I want you to, 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 to focus on it for a second, all right? All right, when you have it, I want to invite you to do something with me. I want to, you to pretend like you're holding it in your hand. And so when you have that thing that makes you feel anxious, I want you to hold it in your hand like you're holding on to it really tight. And I want you to place that thing in front of you if you haven't. And in a minute here, I want you to cast that to God because God cares for us. I want you to, I, in a little bit here, I want to invite you to open your hands up and let go of whatever it is that's anxious and just to give it to God. So whenever you're ready, I'd like to invite you to open your hands, again, whenever you're ready, and release it to God. Whatever it is that makes making you anxious. We're promised that when we present what makes us anxious to God, He gives us His peace. And so when you sense that you've let go of what you, makes you anxious, I'd invite you to take your hand again, imagine God's peace in your hand, and invite you to close up that peace. And I want you to invite you to say a quick prayer, thanking him for his peace and his care for us. And so take a second and just say a quick prayer, thanking him for his peace and his care for us. You might not feel peaceful right now, but again, it's the promise that we will experience his peace when we give something up. And so take a second, say a quick prayer, thanking him for his peace. And then let me pray for us to close.